today I'll talk to you very briefly on uh, the importance of a living master in our spiritual quest and how if we do not have a living master, one who is enlightened beyond the level of the mind, we will always be duped by our own minds. People have so many teachers who teach them spiritual paths at a mental level. And the mind is such a a powerful force we have inside ourselves that if there is nobody who has had actual access to a level of consciousness beyond the mind to help us, we can remain trapped in the different merry-go-rounds that the mind makes us go through. And we never get to a point where we can say that we have got real enlightenment. Spiritual enlightenment does not come by just making your mind very sharp or the intellect having a good understanding of things. I just was reading a new book that's been published by the RSSB Bias called One Being One by one Davison. And in the beginning, out of the uh, you know little quotes they give to start a book, he's given a quote from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I was surprised that he should pick up that author for a spiritual book because uh, when he says I think that guy has no brain or not no he has a brain he can think he has a brain and then Piglet says yeah I think so then there's a silence and Piglet says that's why he can't understand anything <laughs> that's the introduction to that book but the book emphasizes that the reality, if we can call it the ultimate, absolute reality, is there is only one consciousness. One total consciousness is the only reality. Everything, everything else is created within that reality as a play. All levels of creation, such Khand included, all heavens included are all built into that one reality which has never been split, has never been broken, has never changed. It's always the same. And I like to describe it as totality of consciousness because it is consciousness that has the ability to be conscious of anything it wants to be. That's why it's called consciousness. Consciousness means that you have the ability to get an awareness of whatever you want. And when total consciousness becomes aware of anything, it becomes creation. And to make the creation an objective reality and to enjoy it better, you put several rules of creation, several laws of nature into every level. And those laws of nature then determine the level of reality that we can experience. So ultimately, our aim is to understand how this big show has been set up, the grand picture. If we can see the grand picture, then we can understand our own role in it. We can also see why the one became the many, how the many have been trapped in a trapping which was set up to create a reality out of illusion. When you say that Consciousness, by becoming conscious of something, can make it real. That is illusion. It's not reality. The reality is the consciousness. But what it is experiencing, what consciousness experiences, is the illusion. But the illusion has to be made into reality. So, so many beautiful steps have been taken to make our experiences within consciousness absolutely real. The first thing that has been done to totality of consciousness is to impart to it a feeling that there is more than one. The moment the consciousness has certain attributes of its own, which we believe are total bliss, total knowledge, total uh, competence, total prevalence, all the totalities that you can think of, if the consciousness has that, it has also total love. But love to be experienced 
creates the many. It is remarkable how love is the fundamental force, the fundamental gift that totality of consciousness has, which makes it experience the many. And the many within totality of consciousness are called the souls, the spirits, the spirits, the individuated consciousnesses, which are still part of the totality, but they are looking at the creation through consciousness from different points of view. They have been located in space and time at different places so that they can begin to believe they are individually real. That's a great step forward to make one consciousness into many and make that many realize that they are really all individual realities. Very big step taken. And why is it done? So that the love and the bliss and the joy and the beauty that's built into consciousness can be experienced by the many and with the many. So that sets up a certain pattern of relationships. That means if you want to talk about love, you cannot talk about love unless there is more than one. It's built into it. So that is why the need for more than one. And that's why the need for more than one then goes on forever because well, once you begin to see the interaction between different parts of total, total consciousness, then you find that the joy and beauty and experience of love within the one is multiplied as many times as the many you create. So what a wonderful device that consciousness itself has. It jumps from there and in order to create more realities, it adds on more accessories by creating them through consciousness also. The biggest accessory created in order to have this overwhelming experience of love and spiritual oneness is the creation of an entity called the mind. The mind is a wonderful machine. It's the best machine ever invented. I have looked at all the gadgets, and I'm a gadget guy, you know that. And I have not found anything more wonderful, more amazing, and more efficient than the human mind. The human mind is a thinking machine. It thinks all the time. It thinks for survival. If the mind stops thinking, it will be dead. The mind survives by thinking. But that's a wonderful thing. When consciousness is coupled with a mind, then the consciousness can experience communication through the mind. It has a voice. Suddenly, the one who was only a listener of its own melody, of its own joy, of its own love, suddenly has a voice added to it, can speak. So I have said many times to you that in our own conscious setup, soul always listens and the mind always speaks. If you want to know in meditation, where is your mind? Any voice you hear is the mind. Any voice. It may be your voice. It may be some friend's voice. It may be the master's voice. It may be any voice. Any voice that you can hear, it may be your own mind speaking about some comment it's trying to make or communicating. All speech is being made by this new device we've got in our heads called the mind. But the soul continues to be the listener of all that. The mind then begins to function not only as a thinking machine, as a device, it also then goes to one step down below and begins to create something which we call time and space. That's a beautiful thing. Because time and space now gives vastness to the experience. It creates a past. It creates a future. And it creates here and there. Here and there, now and then. These are so fundamental for making our experiences real. The mind is doing that. Not only that, the mind then we move to the next layer of creation. The layer in which the mind, in order to have these experiences, sets up a system by which instead of absorbing 
can experience directly begins to get them through sense perceptions. Mm. We can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell. So the different sense perceptions come up and whatever has been created becomes an objective reality which we are receiving through perception, through sense perceptions. And the mind sitting inside us and speaking in us constantly speaks to us and tells us what we are perceiving. Many people have not uh, noticed this, that when you see something, if I see this drink, I'm just going to touch it, tastes good, smells good. I just had an experience, but did you know that if the mind did not tell me, this is a drink, this tastes like this, and that's what it is, what your senses are telling us, I would never have experienced. Sense perceptions per se are so wild pictures. They have no meaning unless the mind gives meaning to them. The mind does a great job interpreting all the time. Notice carefully. Any sense experience that you have is being interpreted in your head by your mind. That's what becomes a perception. Perception does not come merely from seeing or touching or tasting. It has to be interpreted. What are you touching? What are you tasting? What are you doing? The mind does that function. Then the mind can rearrange these perceptions and create new ones. It becomes a creative, very strong creative instrument. So the mind is a very, very fundamental, useful thing for us to enjoy creation. But then that is not all. After we get into this sensory perceptions, then we tie it all up, bundle up in one small little, very compact package called the human body, physical human body. The human physical body contains all the setup. The human physical body contains the sense perceptions operating on their own, the mind interpreting them, the mind thinking continuously so that there is a constant commentator on what's going on, an endless commentator while we are alive and consciousness experiencing the whole show. What could be better than this? What a wonderful setup. And this is a human body that contains the sense perceptions, it contains the mind, it contains our indi individuated soul, and it contains the totality, the creator himself or herself. Therefore, this human body is the most compact thing ever created. It's not only compact from the physiological sense in terms of its uh, anatomy, in terms of how these organs have been placed so well, how there are hundreds, thousands of miles of nerves running through it, how there is uh, the systems, all the systems are working so wonderful without our knowledge, that the body is being maintained without our knowledge. So many autonomous systems have been set up. Apart from that, there are some parts of the body which are functioning to control even thoughts, to control even the awareness of who we are. Mm. It has within ourselves the ability to know the whole thing that I just described, the ability to know our totality of consciousness. It's all fixed in this one body. The human body is the greatest creation. There's nothing like it. The human body has everything needed for any kind of knowledge, any kind of spirituality, any kind of experience of the transcendental of any kind. Within this human body, with all these things intact, you can transcend your awareness of the body, you can transcend your awareness of the sensory perceptions, you can transcend even your mind, and you can transcend your individuation and become total while you're still in the body. The ability exists and planted inside us. What, what better can you think of the creator who could put all that in a simple human body? A human body has two parts. And the dividing line for the two parts is little, it's not well balanced in shape or in the size. The lower part below the eyes runs the energies and maintenance system of this body. And the part that's at the eye level and above runs the consciousness part of it, the awareness part of it. If we want to expand our awareness, we go behind the eyes and above. If we want to strengthen our energies, we go below the eyes. 
a big division, but just a good division. So the secrets of higher awareness, which very often the spiritual path advocates we should get, so that we have understanding why we are here, and we have a better look at the play, and we enjoy the play better than we are doing now. That part of getting higher awareness lies behind the eyes and above, not below. Of course, the energy centers which regulate all the energies to maintain this body and because of the maintenance of the body, all its connection with the rest of the world are all below the eyes. And they are performing those various functions. Starting from the bottom, there are six levels, six centers, which we can identify as representing different energy levels. They are all performing their own function. But the awareness does not lie there. People have had practices on running into the energy centers, which is very easy for us to do because we have been going from the eye center in a wakeful state to the lower energy centers every night when we go to sleep. They are used to it. So people who are doing <clears throat> a meditational practice, who are trying to discover their inner self in the body by going to the energy centers below, they don't have much difficulty because every time they go to sleep, the energy centers are anyway accessed by them. When they're having a dream, they're already accessing the center of power in the throat. When they're having deep dreams, they're accessing the power in the heart. When they are doing deep meditation of a yogi, they're going into the nabi. When they are practicing the kundalini yoga, they're going into the genitals. And when they are going into the wishful uh, discovery of their wishful self, going right to the bottom. These functions are being performed automatically and people have been able to travel up and down these. And there are two very easy routes set up to go to these different energy centers. There is the staircase and there is an elevator. Mm -hmm. The staircase runs in front. From one level to the other, you can climb up. And there is an elevator running in the spine. The spine connects all the centers from the back. So many of these practitioners who have explored these energy centers in various kinds of yoga, they have been able to go either go down straight by the elevator and then they start from the bottom and they go step by step and come up. Come up where? They come up to the eyes which represent the top sixth level. The eyes are called the two petal lotus in the description given in some of the ancient uh, scriptures in India. They describe all these as uh, lotuses. There's a lotus with different petals. The four petal lotus at the bottom, then six, then eight, then twelve, sixteen, and then again two. Then two again starts all over. So it's like a circuit that goes from the two petals up to the sixteen petal and it moves continuously. Our, our energies are constantly drawing our life power, our consciousness into these centers to make us alive and to make all these autonomous functions function efficiently. Now you can get into these things, but you cannot call it a spiritual discipline because spirit is not involved. Your energy is involved, but energy is not spirit. Energy is not awareness. Energy is an application of awareness to certain functions that are being performed. When you want to have expanded awareness, then it must start from behind the eyes and go behind and above and not below. So therefore, these perfect living masters whose company is necessary in order to have real enlightenment, they come and tell us that you have to go behind the eyes and above and don't waste your time. They even say that much. Don't waste your time exploring the lower centers because you are in a mansion. You're sitting in a mansion called the human body at the sixth floor. You want to go to the eighth floor. You want to go to the sixteenth uh, floor. Why would you go down to the basement? You don't need to go to the basement. So it's not necessary to have those practices which many yogis are doing in order to explore what kind of experiences the concentration of attention on the energy centers can create. And they do create wonderful experiences. 
they create even out of body experiences but the out of body experience created by an energy center is very different from an out of body experience created by the center behind the eyes in the case of the out of body experience that many yogis have been able to create for themselves the experience is from the heart heart chakra or heart center from the heart center it looks that they are connected even when they are having an experience of being separated from the body they are not disconnected from the body they don't think the body was just a cover they think the body is the real thing and now they have a slightly unreal thing moving out mm -hmm. and they are just moving away attached with a silver cord and if they go too far the silver cord might break and then die they are afraid i have met so many people who have had these out of body experiences and i find fear writ large on their faces just for this one reason they don't want to die they think there is a risk involved in an out of body experience through the heart center but what happens if you have an out of body experience from the eyes and behind it when you pull your attention to the eyes the body disappears virtually from your consciousness you don't even know you have a body and you can fly into another sky into another region altogether and fly back into the body and regain the consciousness for over it again there's no silver cord holding you back you can fly in, into the different galaxies you can fly into all the worlds that you can think of imagine and many worlds beyond so there's a big difference in the kind of experiences we have through the energy centers and through the my 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 master the great master he went to karachi i mentioned the story before some of you may not have heard that there was a swami there who used to practice the yoga of the six centers he also was a great practitioner of ayurvedic medicine my uncle was working in uh, karachi uh, which is now pakistan a port town and had a beautiful home on the beach and uh, he was a meteorologist weatherman and he would send out the balloons in the morning and see what kind of weather there is so he was a disciple of the great master and he invited the great master to visit his home and stay there so master agreed and with party from the dera great master and the party which included me as young a young man and this is happened in 1941 and i also accompanied that group to karachi and there my uncle and aunt said it's a good time to introduce our swami to whom they used to go not for spiritual guidance but for ayurvedic medicines he was a good vaid that means he was a good ayurvedic doctor he would give prescribe very good remedies so they invited the great master and told the swami ji swami ji our master is coming from punjab far away and uh, we'd like you to meet him and swami ji said yes bring him i will bless him so they didn't expect that they they're bringing the master to get dressing from the swami they thought the swami might learn something from the enlightened master anyway they were little embarrassed how to handle it so when the master was staying in their house they decided to avoid further embarrassment they'll invite the swami ji to lunch and they had a love seat where the only two people could sit and they would make the great master sit on that seat and the swami will sit on the seat and uh, they will interact with each other and they'll get a chance to meet each other and that's precisely what happened and great master was staying in the house the swami ji arrived he wore very nice uh, um, saffron colored orange orange colored robes and a very beautiful man i i liked him a lot and he had a nice uh, tight turban and he had a, a, a muffler cloth muffler cotton cloth which he called a patka and they would hold that that helped him to walk with grace like this <laughs> you see he used that to walk so he arrived in that great form and uh, they made him sit down on that love seat and then they said master will be coming soon uh, for lunch so then they told great master and he came out of his bedroom and they said master kindly sit down here we introduce you to this swami ji so great master sat down and swami brahmanand ji that was his name he was sitting next to him and uh, my aunt said 
Master, this is the Swamiji that we have been talking to you about who gives us Ayurvedic medicines. And great Master put his hands like this and turned to Swamiji like that, greeting him. And Swamiji raised his hand like this. <laughs> and Dr. Master, he said, I bless you. And we were watching. I watched the show too, I must tell you. And we said, something is not going right. <laughs> we thought, we didn't know that this is going to happen. That we have brought Great Master to get these blessings of his Swami. And the Great Master has been telling us how these yogi, yogis and Swamis are trapped themselves because of the energy centers. Anyway, while they were sitting there, Great Master turns to Swami Brahmananda and says, Swamiji, isn't it a pity that all these Swamis and yogis and practitioners of yoga are caught up in the six centers below the eyes? And they know nothing about the 18 centers. And Brahmana said, I have never heard of these 18 centers. What are you talking about? He said, these six centers are of Pinda, physical. These are all Pinda, physical centers. Then there are centers of Anda and Brahmanda behind. Six centers of that. The six centers of Sachkanda, the true, uh, true centers of awareness. Have you never heard of them? I must confess, Master, I've never heard of these things. Can you throw some more light on this and explain to me what these centers are? I've been practicing this yoga for so many years. I never heard of these 18 centers. Master said, you know, we have limited time here. This is a long subject. But if you come to the Dera in Punjab, I will explain to you these 18 centers. And the meeting ended. But Swami Brahmana, being a true seeker, he couldn't believe that he had missed out on these 18 chakras all this while. And how is this confined to the six chakras of Pinda of the body and not of the Anda or the astral plane where sensory perceptions arise, or Brahmanda where the mind resides, or such Khanda where the soul resides? He had no idea, although the scriptures have mentioned these things, but he did not know how these 18 centers worked. He got so intrigued, he told his followers, I am packing up, I am closing my ashram here, and I am going to meet that master who came here, and if you want to come along, you can come, <clears throat> otherwise you go and do your own business, I am closing my Ayurvedic shop, I am going to the Dera. So, Swami Brahmanand came to the Dera, and great master was informed that the Karachi man has come, he said, oh, give him the best suite in the guest house. So he was given the very best suite which the Swami had never seen in Karachi. And with all attendants, everybody to attend on him, every need that he has, the Swami, people running around, Sevada running around, taking care of the Swamiji. And Swamiji being fed all kinds of food, whatever he wanted, they would cook and give it to him. And then Great Master said, Swami Brahmanan can see me any time of the day or night, which is a big thing because people saw that uh, people are lined up to have a darshan just to go inside and have a look at the master. This is a new man come, a Swami, and he's been given access 24 hours that he can come and see the master anytime he likes. And to test it, Swami Brahmanan tried it. Middle of the night he woke up. I have come to see the master. All well, doors were opened. That was the instruction. Great master was woken up from sleep. Swamiji wants to see you. Oh, welcome, welcome Swamiji. Yes, what can I do for you? So while this was going on and the Swami was feeling so happy at coming into this new place, in the discourses, Master said, Swamiji will sit next to me on that high dais, on that high platform from which the great Master spoke, that Swamiji will sit next to me. So Swamiji would sit next to him and great Master would then announce to the world, all these Swamis are just caught up in this trap of the six chakras. And they have no idea that the truth lies way beyond. Not only little beyond, way beyond that. Because above the six chakras are the levels of the mind. The whole astral and causal divisions of creation are all within the realm of the mind. The truth lies way beyond the mind. And people have no idea how to transcend the mind. Because they are trying to work everything with their own minds. These six chakras are only a trap. And Swamiji would look at him like this and listen to all that. After a few days, he said, Master, I have a little problem. Great Master said, Swamiji, what is your problem? 
He says, when I sit next to you on the platform and you are giving your discourse, I have to keep on looking at you and my neck gets hurt, you know. It's a pain in the neck. <laughs> sit there like that. Great master said, I noticed that too. I think it's better that you sit in front. So Swamiji stepped down from sitting next to the master on a chair, a special chair is brought and he sits at the bottom. After a few days, he complains. He says, Master, I have a little problem. Yes, Swamiji, what is it? I noticed that when I'm sitting in the chair, you are sitting high up. I have to sit up like this. And my neck, you know, it's again a pain in the neck to keep my neck up like this to look at you. And great master said, yeah, I also noticed that, that you have to strain your neck. So he told the Sevadas, put his chair but 20, 30 rows behind the people. <laughs> so the chair is moved around behind the people. Then after that he says, Master, I have a problem. Now, Swamiji, what is your problem? If I sit on the chair, I'm blocking the view of people behind you. And they grumble and they want to look at you, have your darshan. And I feel I'm, I'm guilty of it. I don't think I should sit on a chair. Great Master said, I think that you are right. Remove the chair. This steps, this goes on and on. And I was in those days trying to practice up homeopathy. He was doing Ayurvedic. Great master had given him a clinic for Ayurvedic. He given me a clinic for homeopathy. And we compared notes one day. He said, this master of yours is very clever diplomat. <laughs> and he brought me here and gave me all the high luxury and all this attention to me. And I felt so happy. And now I am like anybody else standing in line to have his darshan. And I can't go away because he has trapped me with his love. His love has now captured me. And so I can't go anywhere. But he, had he treated me like I am being treated today, I would have run away on the very first day. <laughs> so then he was, he meditated so well. And that Swami realized that the reality, truth lies way beyond that the number of teachers, number of masters who have actually experienced levels of consciousness above the mind are very, very limited. They are very few. The number of gurus and masters is very large. Great master used to say, <clears throat> in India there are more gurus than disciples. <laughs> every village has so many gurus and everybody reading a few books becomes a guru. Everybody learn the terminology and becomes a guru. People do a little yoga, hatha yoga, or karni yoga, or different kind of yogas, and they become a guru. So these people are all playing with energies. They are playing in a very lower level. Some of them who rarely go across and realize that the awareness only awakens at the eyes and above, they still remain trapped in their mind because they're using their mind for every activity. They're using their mind for meditation. They're using their mind for going up. How can the mind take you above its own self and that's the only instrument you are using? There is nothing pulling them from beyond. So therefore, he said it's absolutely necessary for somebody to make a spiritual progress, it is necessary to have a perfect living master. Perfect living master means the perfection lies that his own personal experience should be above the mind. Secondly, he should be living. If he is dead, then how do we know what he is saying? Then we picture him, he is a dead person, picture him and say, that's what he is telling me. People talk to me here about ascended masters giving them messages in their head. I tell them, have you any proof whatsoever that your mind is not giving you those messages? Absolutely no, no proof. The mind concocts all this. The mind is a powerful imaginer and it, it can imagine all these things. Imagine the masters are giving instructions. So you are following the mind. Unless you have a perfect living master who has transcended the mind and talks from there, you have no guidance whatsoever on the spiritual path. The guidance is all mental and it's confined to your own mind. And your own mind will interpret everything the way it likes. Therefore, a living master tells you a when your mind goes wrong, don't do this. Something else is going to happen. And he has a direct connection with you. The perfect living master who has transcended the mind does not have to ever say he's a master. Only those who are mentally in their own ego 
and they have to express themselves as masters, say, I am a master. A perfect living master knows way beyond that, has come to pick up individual souls which are on a list which he carries and they are his marked sheep as a shepherd he comes to collect them. He knows more about the sheep than the sheep know themselves. Therefore, he doesn't have to tell them who he is. He behaves exactly like we would do. There's no difference. If a master behaves extraordinary way, I would be very reluctant to accept him as a master because why does he have to show off? Show off for what? Therefore, the perfect living masters do not come to show off anything. They come to develop a relationship with us based upon something that the soul will catch on and not the mind. And that relationship is based upon love and devotion. It's not based upon thinking and intellect. Thinking and intellect takes you up to a certain point. Above that, you cannot be drawn anywhere higher except by love and devotion. And if you have no second, as I said, the tot totality of consciousness the creator had to create to experience love and devotion by having more than one. How can you have the experience of love and devotion here if you have nobody else to express it and nobody else to love you? It is the innate desire of every spirit, every soul to have an experience of love, both ways to love somebody and to be loved by somebody. It's essential. Without that, we won't survive. The spirit doesn't survive. This is such a basic need. The spirit, not the mind. It's not the mind's need. It's not even the body's need. It's the spirit's need. It's our soul's need. Therefore, these perfect living masters, by coming from that level above the mind, become the most useful instruments for us to have the experience of love and devotion. We can't otherwise have that. And if they are not alive and talking to us like friends, then we are getting nothing out of them, I must tell you. I must confess that this is not a system of remote control that we have master sitting somewhere else and we are getting all the benefits here. How can you? When the very basic principle is that the master can say no to you when your mind says yes and the master can guide you personally, it's only possible if that's the kind of friendly relationship you have. That's why some of the best disciples of great master used to say, a master is not a master first, he's a friend first, master next. If he's not a friend, he can't be in that relationship with you, which is needed if, to have the experience of love and devotion. It's not possible. Therefore, a perfect living master as a human being like us, these perfect living masters, since they have so many disciples, they come to the level of every disciple. It's very strange to see their life, how they will deal with each disciple at that level and come to that level and be friendly at that level. They are the best friends you can ever have because they come to your level. If you are already at high level, they will talk to you at that level. At the lower level, they come there. If you are totally a novice in this path, they become a novice with you. If you are a child, they will become a child with you. That's the beauty because they know us better than we know ourselves. If they don't know us, how can they help us? A perfect living master who has gone above the mind and has union with the soul he has come and has picked us up. He comes and picks up. Doesn't matter where we are. We are on the list of a perfect living master. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the list in a little while. <laughs> and why they have a list. But if you are on the list of a perfect living master, no matter what you do, you'll be picked up. No matter what your karma, you'll be picked up. No matter where you live, you'll be picked up. No matter how good or bad you are, you'll be picked up. It's such a certain thing just to be on the list. Now, the list comes up like this, that every seeker anywhere in the creation who is seeking to return to his original home, original state of being, out of the play, who says, I'm fed up with the play, I've had enough of it. That's first requirement. If you are still enjoying the play, they say, keep on enjoying they give you long rope. Yes, enjoy while you are having a good time here. Have a good time. Then you say, I'm fed up. I've had enough. Then, then your seeking is registered. Actually, it was registered before the souls were even separated from the totality. The registration took place at that time. But since 
we are living in the mind's time and space. So they have been spaced out as to who will be going back where. So these masters are actually the totality of creation, totality of consciousness, totality of everything, come back in a human form. And they come here to pick up at that point, whoever is ready for them. There can be any number of perfect living masters, but it is certain that there is always one. Always one has been there in this world. In this planet Earth, there has always been one at least. There can be many. But many doesn't mean too many. Many means those that have been counted on the fingers of your hands. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rare thing to find that uh, perfect living master. And we can't find him because we don't know how to find him because he looks just like anybody else. He behaves completely like us. He behaves differently. Then he may be a good teacher, but he may not be a perfect living master. A perfect living master behaves like us and comes to our level. Therefore, it's very difficult to know who is a perfect living master. So that is why it's, uh, it is their job to find us rather than our job to search and find a perfect living master. Our job, if we are seekers, is to seek. Seek in your heart. You don't have to shout for it. <laughs> Just seek in your heart and at the right time, a human being like yourself will appear in your life and you will be drawn in a different way toward that human being. And then later on, you'll find that the human being who looks so ordinary is a little extraordinary in some things. <laughs> and what are those some things? One of the very significant things you will notice is that that person's love for you is unconditional. It's not based on what you do for that person at all. It's not, oh, you've been a good boy, I'll give you a little candy now. But I won't give you if you're a bad boy. They give you their grace and love irrespective of how you behave. That's one big thing, very big difference amongst other people. The second is that they will talk to you occasionally mentioning things which will surprise you how could they know it yeah. and this they do occasionally just to create the kind of faith that is necessary in an ordinary person how do you create faith in an ordinary person without showing extraordinary miracles they'll show private miracles a miracle that you will feel this could not have happened but because of that person and it's a miracle but then you want to tell your friends, I had a miracle. They said, that was just a coincidence. That was nothing, no miracle. So that kind of hidden private miracles in abundance. But nothing to show in the public that they are any different at all. So that is why it's a very, very rare opportunity to be found by a perfect living master. If you are ready, you'll be found. It's a guarantee. When you are ready, you'll be found. And it will happen by what we call a strange process called coincidence. A process that goes on in this world all the time and we, we are drawn to it because it is against the laws of probability and chance. Mm -hmm. Things happen which could not, but are not likely to happen. Not likely to happen at that time. Say, so how could this happen at this time? That when I was asking a question in my heart, I opened a book and the answer was right there on that page which I opened. How come I was concerned about something and was driving my car and a roadside ad for something totally different had one phrase which answered my question. How can these things happen? How do these coincidences take place? And then gradually you will discover that coincidences are a part of communication with your own totality. The other way is to have intuitive feelings inside with no thoughts. If you think out something, it's the mind working and the mind will keep on working. But if something comes to you spontaneously, intuitively inside, it's a communication from the inside. And that's generally matched by a coincidence outside. So coincidences are matched by the intuitive knowledge that you get inside. And these happen very frequently after you come in contact with a perfect living master. So that's why that these are some few signs that eventually you will find out that the master uh, has a special relationship and you can't define it very well. And your mind, which creates fear and doubt all the time, will create fear and doubt about the master too. How can I be sure? How can I be sure? 
and you keep on saying that how can I be sure and the master is trying to put you through various kinds of other games to get more friendly with you and you you think that the games are the real teaching he's giving us but you are being drawn by love ultimately you are trapped by the love of the master and all the answers come from there and you will find that he's pulled you from the mental games and the mental things that are happening here to something more real inside this is a progressive game that you will see happening to you is a perfect living master but i just wanted to clarify to you that these stages that i mentioned of how this illusion was created and made into reality each one was blocked from the other so that you cannot compare today sitting here the physical reality in a physical body is the only reality we have no other reality everything else is imaginary i can be talking of heavens and i can be talking of such kind and the true home so i'll talk the reality is we are physical beings sitting here the only reality is a physical body when we go in meditation and become unaware of the physical body that becomes our only reality the physical body disappears and there is no physical reality left when we come back into the physical reality that looks like a dream like an experience that happened and the reality of that disappears this keeps on happening no matter how high you ascend on the spiritual path except when you transcend above the mind then you go above the mind then you see the whole plan how it is all set up and then you can hold on to each reality at the same time and you can be in the physical reality having direct access to every other reality <clears throat> now all the masters have that advantage the perfect living masters who have taken their consciousness to that level they have the advantage that they can operate at all the levels at once and they are not confined to one level so that is why when we go and meet a perfect living master he doesn't look at us from the physical body he's looking at all the way through and he can see our whole package of karma that we come with he has seen what uh, what brought us here he has seen what kind of questions we have he is he is aware of it he also knows what you have to go through in this destiny what will be laid out for you in one glance he can see all that so his casual comments sometimes have a deeper meaning then we can even realize and sometimes we understand after many years the master said that so many years ago that's what he meant because by that time our own awareness is expanded to that level therefore the spiritual path is a real path only if you have a real perfect living master to guide you and his path is love and devotion and not the mental games mental games anybody can teach and we all are teaching each other all the time but to go above the mind is the role of a perfect living master and he will gradually pull you to that level where you will be drawn by nothing else but the love of that master and it's not necessary that the master be highly educated not necessary he should have written many books or he should have read many books not necessary where he lives he not necessary should be rich or poor none of these matter the only thing that makes a human being a perfect living master is that he has attained that level of consciousness above the mind in his own personal experience and therefore he can guide us to that level i hope uh, that all of you sitting here are all fortunate people because you are all on the list of some master or the other and therefore uh, you are all going to experience true spiritual love i guarantee that otherwise you wouldn't be here you are not here for food i know i just made a joke <laughs> and and you are going to be all experiencing that so my introduction to this a perfect living master is only going to help you when you run into a perfect living master you will see the inkling that yes this is what is drawing me this is what is real still it will take time for your mind to build up enough faith to satisfy yourself but gradually patiently you will be able to find out who a perfect living master is without a perfect living master i don't think the spiritual path has any meaning great master used to say his path starts from par brahm above the mind and goes to totality such can't that he is his path starts when we are already above the mind and from there he starts his path so up up to the mind 
there are thousands of teachers available to teach you. On the lower chakras, several hundred thousand people available to teach you that. But a, a perfect living master who can take you above the mind, very few. Very few can be counted on the fingers of your hands. So you are very lucky that you are on some master's list. So I hope you will uh, take the full benefit when the opportunity will come. Okay. Now you can ask any questions on what I have just said or on what I have not said. How can we make the best of the opportunity? How can we take full advantage? Uh, practice whatever the Master says and do your meditation with a stance of love and devotion. That's right. Any question, any comment, any answer? So, um, when you sleep, when someone sleeps, their attention goes down. But it's as simple as becoming aware and having your attention go up, and then you don't sleep. You can still sleep with your attention going up. The difference is, when your attention goes down in normal sleep, in normal sleep, the attention goes down. And you can verify it when you are about to sleep. That's when you should test where you are. And the best point to check out are your eyes. That means with your eyes closed, if you take your hand with your eyes closed and want to touch your eyes in the wakeful state, you can always touch them without anybody guiding you because your hands will automatically reach your eyes. When you are half asleep or about to sleep at night, try the same thing. You try to touch your eyes, you touch your nose. You see that even the level at which you are seeing changes and you feel you are going down. If you could keep your attention on the body even a little deeper sleep and you were to touch your eyes, you touch your throat. In dreams, that's what we will do. In a person who is dreaming, and seeing something and his body is not yet fully asleep which means there is a reflex action going on in the body also as you know some people uh, are, a person is sleeping and giving a lecture and in the sleep body is doing like this also and his eyelids are moving there is a rapid eye movement in the eye and the body also starts doing like this as if it is lecturing with this physical body which is sleeping so there's a connection that is left between the physical body and the sleep body. And if a person at that level, when he wants to touch his eyes in the dream sequence, he will touch his throat and think he's touching his eyes. So this is a normal thing that goes up. But if you meditate regularly and meditate before sleeping, you can create a dream which is behind the eyes and does not go down at all. You can still have a pulling out of the consciousness from the body, same way like sleeping, and still have an experience of dreams which are different than the dreams that you have in the throat center. The difference is the dreams in the throat center are norm normally of uh, one shade of color, like a buff color, like a skin color, deep, light, mostly the seas are like that, reddish and uh, uh, brownish colors. But in the sleep that you have without going down, it's blue, yellow, very bright colors which you have not even seen yet. They come up in your dreams. So there's a way to distinguish between the two types of sleep. And, that, and that's the reality when you, that dream is, becomes a reality. That dream is a real compared to the physical. Yeah. And the other dream is less than the physical. Sounds like fun. Oh, the spiritual path is the greatest fun you can have. I can tell you. Once you start enjoying it, Today, why you don't enjoy meditation is because you close your eyes, it's dark, there's nothing you see. It's a chore to get in. To get into your own head is difficult to, to enjoy when you see nothing. But once you start seeing these beautiful visions inside, it's real fun. Then it's difficult to get you off from meditation. Some, if I've seen people in the Dera who didn't want to get out, they were seeing so much. If you were there at the, at the workshop in Taos, and some people were disturbed by my calling them to open their eyes. Mm -hmm. They were having such a good time. And because you've seen that also. And that uh, there's a lot of fun. The meditation is not, a, uh, is not a hard thing. It's enjoyable. If you meditate and enjoy meditation, you will also start enjoying the show going outside. 
that's another thing that happens because you see it's reality you see it's just a show put up the thing that you're taking as real are not real they're made to look real so that you can experience reality at a physical level so that's why the whole attitude changes with meditation okay yes that's it. <laughs> I'm having trouble with meditation, obviously, and you know they, you know, to try to meditate two and a half hours when I'm having hard enough time sitting for half an hour. Is it better in that case to try to break it up into several half hour periods throughout the day? Yes. I mean, I, it's, it's better like to a chore. Absolutely. It's better to break up the time into several uh, segments and enjoy it. Rather than force yourself to sit for long periods without getting anything, I was uh, visiting a friend in San Francisco who was an old initiate, and he would he said, "Oh, Vishwar, you have come. That's good. We'll meditate tonight." So I said, "I was a little alarmed because I am not meditating so much." And I said, "This guy is going to make me sit up all night." <laughs> anyway, we sat down for meditation, and I. I closed my eyes like he did, and I was just occasionally opening the corner of my eye to see what he was doing. And I would see that every now and then he would look at his watch, <laughs> he would look at his watch, and then go to meditate again. <laughs> and after a while, he would again look at his watch. So after the session, two and a half hours was over. He said, "Oh, that was good, two and a half hours meditation." I said, "But I have a little problem. I think you are meditating more on your watch <laughs> than on the third eye center behind the eyes. So, if you are forcing yourself to do something, that becomes like a ritual. It becomes like religion. It becomes something that you are being forced to do something. It doesn't yield any result. It should be done in a way that you enjoy. Split the time into different different segments." Half an hour each segment, one hour, forty-five minutes, whatever suits you, and then change the timings of it. If a certain time doesn't suit you, change it to another time. Make it comfortable. You must enjoy. It. Meditation should never be forced upon yourself. It should be a state of relaxed feeling. I am going to explore who I am in a relaxed state. You, in a relaxed state, enter the sixth floor of your own house. And enjoy. There's so much, so many goodies we kept there, and I particularly encourage people to decorate that place, decorate the place behind the eyes, so they're attracted to it. They can see it again and again. There's a beautiful place to work in, and so you enjoy meditation that way. Don't force yourself to do a continuous two and a half hours. It will help you. Yes. Any other question? I saw it when I was coming down the steps, you see, and which reminds me of a short story I read, which won a prize. It won a first prize in short story telling. The first story I read when I came to this country, it was about a man who wanted to find his soulmate, and he didn't know who to find. So he was moving around in a grocery store, trying to buy some uh, detergent for laundry, and he saw Tide and Time and all kinds of different. Packets lying there. He said, "I don't know which one to buy." So he closed his eyes to pick up any one. So as he closed his eyes, he was going to pick up a woman passed by. He grabbed her. <laughs> he said, "This must be the soulmate." <laughs> How did she come in my way to buying a laundry detergent? <laughs> so therefore, he decided to marry her. And as the marriage ceremony was arranged, this part of the short story. And the author writes in that short story. And the marriage ceremony was on. A lot of food was laid on the tables. God was in the basement. He was studying how much uh, grace he has given in the month of July. He was looking at the electric meters because electricity is grace. And the story goes on to show that he was looking at the electric meters, say how much grace have I given? And this man who was getting married, he knew God was down and he was going to come up. So when God came up. He could feel his presence behind him, so he said, "God is behind me and going to watch my wedding, my whole ceremony." So he looked around, and he saw God's eyes were not on him but on the food. <laughs> That's how it uh, ends up the story there. <laughs> to make the importance of food. So anyway, this I am sure uh, will deserve your attention. And thank you very much. God bless you. Hope to see you again shortly.